thank you, Rob, and thank you to Nicola Davidson and the IP Association. Um, I'm going to be reading a little bit of material here because I found some wonderful quotes in, in history. I want to talk about um, three revolutions in American law. And I want to start with the American Revolution, and I want to talk about building a national jurisprudence, and particularly a case called Wheaton v. Peters that many of you may have studied. And then finally talk about liberating American law, which is my reason for being up here. I actually had come up to meet with Attorney General Kroger. He was unfortunately quite sick with the flu, um, was actually in the hospital. Um, and so I won't be meeting with him today, but I will be calling him on the phone next week. Um, so let me start with the American Revolution. And I actually want to start in England. On March 22nd in 1775, the Right Honorable Edmund Burke was a leading member of the British Parliament, gave the speech of a lifetime. And the name of that speech was on conciliation with the colonies. And it was about why England should stop this silly war with America. And he gave six reasons. And they were good reasons. Reason number one was, you know, there's a couple million Americans, and that's an awful lot of people to beat into submission. Reason number two was they're on the other side of an ocean and it takes us a few months to get over there and it's really hard to do a war when it takes three months to get an order transmitted. Reason number three was they're very clever, these Americans. They're making a lot of money and if we weren't trying to beat them into submission, maybe we could make some of that money. And those were all very good, but the one I liked was reason number six. And he said, in no country, perhaps in the world, is a law so general a study the greater numbers of the deputies sent to the Congress were lawyers, but all who read, and most who read, endeavor to obtain some smattering in that science. Smattering is an old word that means to study, but not as a professional. So I'm a smatterer in the law because I don't have a license to practice. If you fix your own electrical system, you are smattering in electricity. And he remarked that so many people were smattering in the science of the law. And he gave two pieces of evidence. One was that as many copies of Blackstone's commentaries had been sold in America as were sold in England, much bigger country. And the second was all the people in the government, America, are lawyers or smatterers in the law. And of course in the English Parliament they were not lawyers, the Right Honorable Edmund Burke was a lawyer. But most people were gentlemen and they didn't work as lawyers or members of the bar, they were simply gentlemen. And the effect of the fact that all these Americans were like looking at the law, and this was the corker, the end of, of his big speech. This study renders men acute, inquisitive, dexterous, prompt in attack, ready in defense, full of resources. In other countries, the people, more simple and of a less mercurial class, judge of an ill principle in government only by an actual grievance. Here, they anticipate the evil and judge of the pressure of the grievance by the badness of the principle. They augur misgovernment at a distance and snuff the approach of tyranny in every tainted grievance. And so America's always had a, a very special commitment to making the law available. Uh, law has had a special place in our system of government, but it's been available more generally to the population. How did that get implemented, though? And there is a long and torturous path as to how the, we make a law available to Americans. In the early days of the Supreme Court, they didn't issue opinions. What happened is the justices would get in a room and they, they kind of say their piece. And there were no reporters and people didn't write these things down. And if you wanted to know what the Supreme Court had to say, you went and found somebody at a bar. And by a bar, I mean a place they sell whiskey. And you asked them what the Supreme Court had to say. And so in 1791, the Supreme Court moved from New York to Philadelphia, the new seat of government. And there was a gentleman there named Alexander J. Dallas, who had to supplement his income, taken it upon himself to report on all the local courts. And the Supreme Court moved into his jurisdiction, became a local court, and he started issuing the Dallas reports. Now, in the first year, the Supreme Court didn't actually do anything. And so if you look at one U.S. report, you'll see there's actually no Supreme Court opinions. But Dallas, over time, went and began reporting. And he was a busy guy, and so he didn't make it every time. And he had to ask people what happened. And he wrote up some reports, but there were two problems. He was really slow. It took him five years after the last case was decided for two Dallas before he actually issued the reports. And when he retired in 1800, it took him seven years to publish four Dallas the fourth volume of the U.S. reports. 
The other problem was the reports were notoriously inaccurate. They simply did not report what the courts had decided. So in 1800, the new government moved to Washington, D.C., and a guy named William Cranch had moved to D.C. He was a nephew of President John Adams, and he moved there for a real estate deal, a big speculation deal, and it went totally bust. And he had nothing to do, and so he needed a job. And so he took it upon himself to become the reporter of the Supreme Court of the United States. And he began issuing reports. Self-appointed. Nobody had appointed him to this job. And like Dallas, he was slow and he was inaccurate and the reports were expensive. And it was so bad that the attorney general who needed these precedents in order to argue said that the reporter ought to be supplanted as some penalty for his inexcusable disobedience. And at that point, the Attorney General, Attorney General Rush, and Justice Story, who you may have read about, one of the, the real leaders of the founding of American jurisprudence, thought about a young New York lawyer named Henry Wheaton. And Henry Wheaton had made his name in New York by publishing the Digest of the Law of Maritime Captures and Prizes. And it was a beautiful scholarly work, and it was really well done. And so they went and they saw Wheaton, and they convinced him to move to Washington, D.C. Now, Washington, D.C. in those days was described as a picture of sprawling aimlessness, confusion, inconvenience, and utter discomfort. Not that different from today. <laughs> um, the justices actually all lived together in one rooming house, and they took all their meals together because that was the only place they could find near their office. And so Wheaton became their roommate, moved in with the Supreme Court, attended every single session, and from 1816 to 1827, he did an amazing job. His reports were accurate. He attended every session. He got the justices to give him their notes. His books were beautiful with lots of white space and beautiful bindings, prepared abstracts and, and cross indices. Um, and he was timely. Within two months of the end of the 1816 term, he had his report ready to publish. He presided over what's known as the Golden Book of American Law. Cases like McCulloch v. Maryland, Gibbons v. Ogden, cases you've probably all read about. And he did it for 12 years. He was so effective that the Supreme Court urged and the Congress gave him a thousand bucks as a salary. But it wasn't really a salary because in return he also had to give 80 copies of each of his books to the government to use. And after about 12 years he resigned because he just wasn't making enough money. And he took a State Department post in Denmark at four times what he was making as a Supreme Court reporter. And so in 1828, the court appointed a guy named Richard Peters, Jr. Now, unlike Wheaton, Peters was a businessman, right? Wasn't really a scholar of the law. And he wanted to make money at this. And so he did two things. He issued the annual reports. And they weren't as nice as the previous ones from Wheaton. The paper was cheaper. There weren't as big of margins. The binding wasn't as good. But they were cheaper to produce. And the Supreme Court liked that. He had a second component, though. In those days, if you wanted, even today, if you want to practice the law, you need everything, right? You need the full corpus. And if you wanted to buy the two volumes of Dallas, the nine volumes of Cranch, and the 12 volumes of Wheaton, that cost you $130. And in those days, most lawyers were making less than $100 a year. So this was expensive. So Peters had a scheme, and he proposed to publish the condensed reports of cases of the Supreme Court. And for 36 bucks, he promised you could get the entire back file. Get everything. 27% of the current price. The condensed reports wouldn't be nearly as nice, right? He was going to leave out the dissenting report, the um, opinions and the concurring opinions, and no abstracts, no arguments of counsel, no scholarly notes like Wheaton did, um, but they'd be cheap, $6 a volume. And the justices were intent on building a national jurisprudence. They knew that lawyers had to have copies of the cases, and so they said, fine, go for it. The reporters, on the other hand, that had done the previous volumes, weren't as impressed. Now, Dallas, by this time, was dead and his copyright had expired, so that wasn't a big deal for him. Cranch was a sitting judge in the District of Columbia by that time, and he was still out of pocket $1,000 for having produced the Cranch report. That's how much he had lost on that enterprise. And he had hoped that over time, more volumes of Cranch would sell and he'd make his money back. He ended up settling. And what happened is Peter said, okay, I'll give you 50 copies of each of the condensed reports and you can turn around and sell those. And so Cranch was eh, happy. Wheaton, on the other hand, was not happy at all because he was counting on the Wheaton reports to be his retirement fund. 
He was hoping these things would sell over time and he'd retire off that. Hadn't made him much money yet, but it was his nest egg. So Peter started publishing, and he started with Dallas, and then Cranch. In 1929, he had the first report of Dallas out. Now, he was a smart guy, Peters. He dedicated the first volume most respectfully and affectionately to Chief Justice Marshall. He made sure to get a free copy over to Justice Story with a nice inscription on it. And they were a big success. They sold out. In 1931, when volume three appeared, he had printed 1,500 copies, and he had advanced sales for 900 of those. So he's actually getting these things out the door and, and moving some product. And in 1831, he published the first condensed reports from Wheaton. And Wheaton sued. <coughs> Daniel Webster as his attorney. And there were injunctions, and the injunctions were dismissed, and it went back and forth, and it was just a total mess. And it was really clear this was going to go all the way to the top. This was going to have to go to the Supreme Court. And in 1834, it was ready for the Supreme Court. And Wheaton came back from Denmark ready to prepare his case, and he was pissed off. Peter saw him in the street and wrote back to a friend that Mr. Wheaton appeared to be very mad. He worked very hard on his case. Went to prepare his argument. He said he was the author as the reporter. He had the exclusive right to copy these materials. He had performed the public service. He was counting on the revenue. He had a right to a copyright in these materials. Now, Peter's fought that tactic. He did a couple things. He said, well, first of all, Wheaton failed to properly secure his copyright by filing his copies. And so he tried a variety of administrative reasons. And then he advanced a novel argument. He said in his brief, it is therefore the true policy influenced by the essential spirit of government that laws of every description should be universally diffused to fetter or restrain their dissemination must be to counteract that policy. Now, the court really didn't want this case. Remember, they lived with these guys, right? Wheaton was their roommate. He was a buddy of stories. And so, just the story, on March 18th and 1834, called all three of the living reporters into his chambers, right? He called in Cranch and Wheaton and Peters, and he was very friendly, and he said he was acting entirely on his own book. It wasn't the court. But he told the reporters that if the court were to rule on this, they would say there is no right of property in the opinions of the court. But he strongly believed that the matter was a fit subject for honorable compromise between the parties, and he wanted them to settle. And Wheaton would have none of it. He didn't want compromise. He wanted the court to rule. And at that point, he was really pissed off. And so the next day, the court met. Now, just the story, conveniently, was on the 8 a.m. stage out of town, so he wasn't there. And the court in those days was kind of dysfunctional. Andrew Jackson was the president, and he was loading the court with people that were very much against people like Chief Justice Marshall. Uh, Chief Justice Marshall was getting old. Um, the dignity and character and courtesy of the court had declined remarkably. There was a lot of argument. Some of the judges were deaf. Some had severe indisposition. Justice Baldwin was one of the new justices, and he was known to be not only eccentric, but occasionally violent. So on March 19th, the court met without Justice Story. And Justice McLean read the opinion of the court. And as he read it, um, these are letters that went back and forth. And by the way, there's a wonderful article by Craig Joyce. You can search him in SSRN.com. And Craig Joyce goes through the early materials for Wheaton v. Peters, and many of my quotes are drawn from his scholarly articles. Um, Wheaton became strongly excited during its reading. Thomas and Baldwin delivered dissents. McLean rejoined that their dissents were totally misplaced. Thompson responded with intemperate warmth. These are strong languages for those day and age. Marshall, of course, revered Chief Justice, tried to make peace, and he made a statement of statutory construction, which, of course, everybody listened to very respectfully. McLean couldn't leave well enough alone, and so he gloated that that's what he had meant in the first place, and he reread that part of his opinion and then remarked at the end that this dialogue across from one to another was very unpleasant that had been occurring. Of course, Thompson at that point rejoined in a perfect boil. Baldwin showed in no uncertain terms by looks and motions and whispers that he was not pleased and had a strong passion at his back. Justice Duvall sat utterly dumbstruck by the grotesqueness of the scene and wrote back later that a large number of the bar looked on in anxiety and grief. In short, all hell broke loose. <laughs> But the ruling was complicated, and I do urge you to read it because it's one of the fundamental pieces of early copyright law. It's the first ruling on the Copyright Act. 
But the last sentence of that opinion is the one that really matters. And in that one, the justice has said, it may be proper to remark that the court are unanimously of opinion that no reporter has or can have any copyright in the written opinions delivered by this court and that the judges thereof cannot confer on any reporter such right. This was new jurisprudence. Prior to that, it was conceivable at least that the reporters owned the copyright in their work. Remember, opinions weren't being delivered, and so the reporters were kind of making it up, right? So it was, in a sense, their opinions. But the justices here felt that this was an important piece of the emerging national jurisprudence they were putting together. So Wheaton went back to Denmark, ended up serving six presidents. He wrote the classic treatise on American law, on international law, um, died a revered figure. Uh, by 1843, the justices had had enough of the inaccuracies of Peter, and they summarily fired him. And they moved on to a new reporter. And in fact, that was the end of the named reports, if you will. Um, at that point, the court took much, much stronger control over a lot of their opinions. So this policy, that access to the law of the land shall be unfettered by property claims and copyrights, is one that has been consistently stated ever since. Now, there, there's some complications, but the basic principle, for example, in Banks v. Manchester in 1988, they applied this principle to state opinions as well as federal. And let me quote, they said, judges, as is well understood, receive from the public treasury a stated annual salary fixed by law, and can themselves have no pecuniary interest or proprietorship as against the public at large in the fruits of their judicial labors. This extends to whatever work they perform in their capacity as judges, as well as to the statements of cases and head notes prepared by them as such, as such as the opinions and decisions themselves. The question is one of public policy, and there has always been a judicial consensus from the time in the decision in the case of Wheaton v. Peters. And then they go on and they quote that famous sentence that I just showed you. This policy has applied not only to state court opinions, but to state statutes. In Howell v. Miller, in 1898, Justice Harlan stated that no one can obtain the exclusive right to publish the laws of a state in a book prepared by him. So the core principle is very clear. While states may own a copyright, they may not own a copyright in the law. There is a protected center. It is conceivable that a state can own copyright in a training film, or in a brochure, or in a book. And that's a different issue. But at the center, the statutes and the opinions and the primary legal materials, there is no copyright. Now, this principle has sometimes been confused when external vendors are commissioned to become reporters. And these vendors add values to the basic laws. For statutes, they might create an index or annotations. For laws, at the, end, the vendors may create headnotes. But even here, the courts have been careful and have repeatedly ruled that the law itself has no copyright. Indeed, even if the law was created by a private party, once it's enacted as the law of the land, anybody can make copies. And a good example of this are our public safety codes, building codes, fire codes, electrical, plumbing, boiler codes, fuel and gas. These are the laws that most directly touch our daily lives. It's every contractor has to understand how our building codes work. Most of these public safety codes are developed by nonprofit organizations, such as the National Fire Protection Association and the International Code Consortium. These standard model codes are then incorporated by reference by typically state legislatures, declaring them to be the law in a given jurisdiction. And most of these model codes, in fact, have a, a page at the beginning that show they are meant to be the law. Typically, the first page says, has a sample resolution that, that reads, we the people of, insert name of jurisdiction here, do hereby enact the following as a law of the land. So we now get to the third revolution, the liberation of American law. In 2002, Peter Vec, in Texas, spent $74, and he bought and posted a model code for his northern Texas community. The Southern Building Code Congress sued him for copyright infringement. The district court granted the code people an injunction and monetary damages, and Pete appealed. And in 2004, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals reversed. And they were very clear, citing their brethren in the First Circuit. It is hard to see how the public's essential due process right of free access to the law, due process right, that's a constitutional right, including a right, necessary right freely to copy and circulate all 
or part of a given law for various purposes, it is difficult to see how that can be reconciled with the exclusivity afforded a private copyright holder. Perhaps there is copyright in a model building code, but once that code becomes law, it has no copyright. Now you may say to yourself, well what about those poor code people, right? They need the money in order to fund the code building process. As one person put it to me when I posted the fire codes for the entire country online, you are making it harder for people to develop high quality fire code. You are killing people. Now I don't believe that. I thought that was a little over the edge. And the court didn't believe it either. And they gave three reasons why posting these codes online would not destroy our voluntary code building process. First of all, they said that building codes that existed for 60 years, no court had ever ruled that the building codes as enacted by law were copyrighted. Right? So that, that would have been a, a market departure from previous public policy. They also said these codes would exist even without copyright. And the court said it is difficult to imagine an area of creative endeavor in which the copyright incentive is needed less. Trade organizations have powerful reasons stemming from industry standardization, quality control, and self-regulation to produce these model codes. It is unlikely that without copyright they will cease producing them. Remember, copyright is there to promote the arts and useful sciences, right? It's not there necessarily to give people money. That's a nice side effect. Reason number three the court gave is that the code people were in a favored position to make money from value-added products. They could, quote, easily publish them, as do the compilers of statutes and judicial opinions with value added in the form of commentary, questions and answers, lists of adopting jurisdictions, and other information valuable to a reader. The organization could also charge fees for the massive amount of interpretive information about the codes that it doles out. In short, we are unpersuaded that the removal of copyright protection from model codes only when and to the extent they are enacted into law disserves the progress of science and the useful arts. And I agree with the value added thing. If, if you look at these codes, they're very complex. And if you want the ultimate seminar on how to use a fire code or the annotations of the fire code, who better than the National Fire Protection Association to go to for your seminar? And so by having their stuff enacted into law, they actually get huge monetary value. So this principle that nobody owns the law is one that's deeply meshed in the fundamental principles of our Constitution. I mean, seriously, when we say we are a nation of laws, not of men, it means that we print down what we do. We don't arbitrarily rule. How can we have equal protection under the laws if those laws are locked up behind a cash register? And how can we have due process if the only way to access the laws is by having a credit card with enough room on it? It's truly an issue that's fundamental. But it's an issue that's honored mostly in the breach. Now, many of you may remember a year ago, my organization, Injustia, one of the leaders in the free law movement, received a takedown notice from the Oregon legislature saying we had violated their copyright in the Oregon revised statutes. And we stood our ground. In fact, we were prepared to go to court. We drafted a declaratory relief um, judgment action, actually published it on the net and asked people if they had any comments on it. And in what I have called many times a shining example of democracy in action, the state legislature held hearings, they brought us up, and they asked us what we thought, they asked the legislative council what he thought, they asked the citizens of Oregon what they thought, and then they unanimously voted to waive any assertions of copyright. So they did not say we do not have the right to make copyright, they simply said even if we have the right to copyright, we're just not going to enforce it. And the result of removing these barriers is that we went from the Oregon Revised Statute site, which was awful, piece of crap, I'm sorry, I've been doing database programming for two decades, this was very bad. And Rob Schechter here of Lewis and Clark came out with OregonLaws.org, and it's just a wonderful example of how legal information can be made dramatically better once the fences around the public domain have been removed. This is as much about innovation in the legal marketplace as it is about democracy and justice. It's about giving better tools to people to practice the law. But despite clear national public policy, despite clear legislative policy in Oregon, copyright continues to be asserted. Professor Bill Harbaugh of the University of Oregon decided he wanted to make available the Oregon Attorney General's Public Meeting and Public Record Manual. 
and he was faced with a copyright assertion and a stern warning that this material could not be deployed without explicit permission of the so-called owner, the Attorney General and the State of Oregon. So the Attorney General's public meeting manual, can you think of a better case study for something that ought to be available, is only one example in Oregon of assertions of copyright by the executive branch. The Secretary of State has a similar chilling warning prohibiting reuse of the Oregon administrative rules and bulletin, and that's a system by which all the regulations of the executive branch are promulgated. And there's more examples. The Oregon Fire Marshal, responsible for enacting the fire code, but if you go look at their website, they are pushing everybody off to a commercial vendor to spend $100. And if you want to look at the fire code, the International Code Consortium has put together a crippleware website for the public. No search capability. You have to know exactly what you want. You can't print. You can't save. You can't download. So every attempt is made to limit your ability to read the Oregon Fire Code unless you spend money with a designated vendor. And not only that, the designated vendor doesn't give any money back to the state. Right? It's not like the state's getting a royalty off that. Same thing is true with the Building Safety Division, part of the ironically named Department of Consumer and Business Services. Again, if you go there and look at the building codes, at the structural integrity codes, at the, at the residential code, same thing. Crippleware site available in which you can't search, you can't save, you can't print, you can't download. All you can do is read on screen if you happen to have the right browser, right? This stuff isn't even browser compatible. But they really want you to go off and the agent of, of these copyright sales, of, of these code sales, is again mistakes. I think this is a situation where Oregon can exert national leadership, explicitly rejecting the policies that were set in place decades ago. And when I talked to Attorney General Kroger's staff, the first thing I said is, look, I understand you are implementing a law that probably comes from the 1940s, but that doesn't mean it's right. At the national level, there's also a huge opportunity for making this material much more broadly available. The federal government spends hundreds of millions of dollars accessing primary legal materials, and that's a small fraction of the $10 billion a year Americans spend accessing the raw materials of our democracy. Recently, public.resource.org has teamed up with our colleagues at law schools around the country. We have 12 top law schools, uh, Yale, Stanford, Harvard, Berkeley, Duke, uh, University of Texas. And we are convening a series of workshops over the next six months to try to persuade the government, the federal government, to create what we call law.gov. You may be familiar with data.gov, in which you can do bulk download of information from the federal government. It's one of the shining examples of the Obama administration's new dedication to open government. We would like to persuade them that they can do law.gov, which is an authenticated, distributed, open source registry and repository of all primary legal materials in the United States. And it is our contention that if the government does this, they will save the federal government over a billion dollars with little spill-off effects, like law students being able to access things like the PACER database, which is carefully rationed right now with legal research suddenly becoming capable because you can download the entire corpus and examine it for systematic discrimination or privacy violations or other things we could do today but are impossible to do. And I'm very pleased that as part of this effort, not only do we have the top law schools, uh, my former boss, John Podesta, who ran the transition team for President Obama, has joined me as a co-convener. Senator Lieberman, on behalf of the United States Senate, has asked us to submit a copy of our report. Um, I've been discussing this with many agency heads and people in Congress, and I think we have a shot at least at preparing a report with sample enabling legislation, a bill of materials that explains exactly what we mean by primary materials, a business plan, and all the materials needed to present this to the President, to the Chief Justice, to the Congress, and convince them that this is something they can add as a function of government. And our vision is that this is based on open source software, so any state can download the software and run their own registry of primary legal materials. Now here in Oregon, one of the reasons I like Oregon, and I'm a former resident of the state, by the way. I lived here for many years. I worked as a volunteer firefighter here. Uh, one of the reasons I like Oregon is unlike many other states, Oregon, as 
A state asserts copyright, right? They don't farm this out to West and Lexus. Oregon prints and sells their own materials. And I think this is a wonderful test case because I think this is an opportunity to demonstrate that a state government believes primary legal materials need to be broadly available. And my request to Attorney General Kroger is a very simple one. There's a dispute on the table. It's a valid dispute. It goes across several agencies of government, the Secretary of State, the Fire Marshal, as well as himself. I would like him to issue an Attorney General opinion. And the Oregon Attorney General's public meeting manual is officially an Attorney General opinion. And I'd like him to issue that opinion on, on what materials may the state assert copyright on. And I'm convinced that after he does the research and looks at these issues and talks to the citizens of the state, that he'll come to the same conclusion that I've tried to lay out for you today. And if you think that this is something that the Attorney General should do, I hope you'll write to him or knock on his door when he's here on campus next and let him know you think this is a real issue. I'll be speaking at the University of Oregon tomorrow, and then next week I'm going to try to take these lecture notes and write them up as, as an essay and, and give them to Attorney General Kroger and try to make the case that this is an example where Oregon can do something very valuable on a national scale. Um, help establish this principle that America's operating system, the rules by which our society lives, ought to be open source. Thank you. Thanks for all the questions. I think we have 20 minutes. Happy to entertain any questions. Yes. So, in reading the years, I, I noticed that they basically argued that court court opinions were not covered because, look, statutes aren't subject to copyright. And no one is ever trying to search that, you know, copyright on statutory codes. That's just, that's just silly. And it, 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 like both sides try to argue this. But, you know, the plaintiff tried to say, well, it is very much, you know, it, it's not at all anything like statutes, court opinions. And then just like, oh, no, no, no. It's exactly like a statute. And, but now we have over half the states copyright the statutes, which I find very interesting. When, when did that tide turn? Because in the, in the 18th and 19th centuries, it seemed pretty clear that I think it's still pretty clear, and that's one of the things the Oregon legislature did in their report to the, um, the, the Legislative Council, went and did a survey, and they said, you know, 26 states have assertions of copyright over their statutes. You know, maybe, maybe we are allowed to assert. Um, I believe this is an instance in which, I don't know why, but we have simply ignored what is clearly established national policy, and I think when, when you talk about statutes and court opinions, state or federal, that's extremely clear. There is no copyright on those. And to assert copyright or to delegate exclusive commercial rights, which is often done, I think it's just clearly wrong. Um, I think when you get to an attorney general opinion, which is viewed with great deference by the courts but is not necessarily the law, I think that's on the edge of that cloud of primary legal materials. But I think with state statutes, that's very clear. And I've actually been working with EFF, who represents me, and I've been talking to the ACLU and others, and we are looking for our test case. We thought we had it in Oregon, but Oregon did the right thing, and we'd always rather settle and simply resolve the situation. Um, so we are actually looking around and trying to decide which of the states is likely. See, one of the issues is I can't go into court and sue the state of Mississippi for a copyright assertion if there is no threat, right, if there, there's no real dispute. And so when Oregon sent us a takedown notice, we sent this is good, um, which is why, again, Oregon sent a takedown notice on the Oregon Attorney General's public meeting manual. That seemed like an opportunity to press the issue a little bit more. But uh, on the state statutes, I, I just don't think anybody can read the laws, uh, the, the court cases, and, and say that there's any sustainable copyright interest. But it's, it's got a huge chilling effect, right? When you see that copyright notice, as a businessman, you're not going to take that stuff. And it's a huge issue for those of us working in the open law movement because we want to take statutes from all 50 states. And I can't go clear copyright, right, with 50 different states and, you know, sub-agencies. And it just makes it impractical to build that national collection of the law. And that's something that public policy argues we should have. Yes, so, um, uh, so PACER is the district court dockets and opinions. Um, it's for all our federal trial courts. 
It costs eight cents a page to access. If you are a law student, you probably don't have access to PACER because the law library doesn't want to spend money on you. Um, <laughs> so um, PACER is eight cents a page. The, um, the administrative office of the courts is bringing in a uh, hundred million dollars a year in PACER revenue at this point. It's, it's big business for them. Um, we believe they are charging more than their actual cost of dissemination, and Senator Lieberman sent them a note um, about that. And they ended up with a, um, a, a judiciary IT revolving fund that had $150 million in it. And the House Appropriations Committee said, what are you doing with all that money? What about broader public access? And so the administrative office of the courts with the government printing office came up with a first step, which is they would do a public access program in 17 specific libraries to see, quote, whether members of the public had any desire to look at this material. There's a feeling in the administrative office of the courts that the only people who care are pro se prisoners. And there is a fee waiver for, for prisoners and people representing themselves to get free PACER. But the idea is that normal people just have no interest in this stuff. So they put these 17 test sites out there. Now that's one library for every 20,000 square miles in the United States. So it's not necessarily one right next door. I think your closest one was Sacramento. Um, and they ran this for a few years. Now I had a PACER recycling site that was up, pacer.resource.org in which I encourage people, what I call the thumbnail, um, the thumb drive core, to go to these public access sites and download some documents and upload them to my system and we make them available for everyone. Recycle your PACER docs, help serve, save the public domain. Young gentleman looked at that and took it to heart and he used the Sacramento Public Library to start downloading documents. And about a month later, when the courts woke up and finally looked at their access laws, they noticed that the biggest user in the nation was now the Sacramento Public Library, and he had brought in 20 million pages. Um, and they promptly canceled the entire program, no notice whatsoever, no explanation, canceled an entire national program. Uh, they called the FBI and sent them off after this gentleman. Now, I had the data because he uploaded it to my system, and we audited that data for privacy violations, found numerous social security numbers, huge number. I'm talking like a 100-page document in a medical malpractice suit that had all the patients for that doctor, 400 patients, name, home address, social security number, age, and medical and psychological problems, all listed, all perfectly available to the public, and this was on West, it was on Lexus, it was on Pacer, right? So this was not private information at this point. We did a full audit, sent it to Judge Rosenthal, 150-page document, complete with a DVD that had the redacted and the unredacted documents, and a handy little HTML page so you can compare them. Sent it into her in the administrative office of the courts, sent a preliminary audit and a final audit, and they ignored us. Started sending it to the 30 district courts that we had done the audit on, and I started sending third and final notices sent to the chief judge, and I said, you were notified, notice one, notice two. Now, these went to the administrative office, and we knew they had to show them to the judges. So when I said third and final notice, this was the first time they were looking at this. And big red letters. It was something I did with a big gulp, because we don't like to send a chief judge a third and final notice. Um, chief Judge Lamberth from the D.C. District wrote me back immediately, said, you're right, we've removed those documents. Uh, we started walking through the courts one by one. Um, every one of them ended up agreeing that these were violations. Some refused to act and said it was a lawyer's job. And we said, no, you need to notify the lawyers. Uh, Senator Lieberman picked this up, sent a long, fairly nasty note to the uh, administrative office of the courts, uh, addressed also to the judicial conference, asked, how come you're charging so much? What about the privacy issues? New York Times picked it up, always gets their attention. Um, Judge Rosenthal answered, and on behalf of the judicial conference said, you're right, we got privacy problems. Uh, Mr. Duff answered on behalf of the administrative office of the courts and said, this money is none of your concern. Congress didn't allocate any money. We're just doing, we're just recovering our costs. And so they, they said, the hell is it on the money? But on privacy, they admitted it was an issue. Um, three months later, judicial conference had a new privacy rule in, in place, and that's got to be a record for a judicial conference rule change. Um, and now whenever a lawyer logs into PACER, they have to click a box that says, I understand my privacy um, uh, responsibilities. When they file a document, it says, have you filed? Um, they have developed and hopefully are deploying software to proactively scan for privacy issues. Um, the, uh, in the meantime, the law librarians are all saying, well, what about this public access program? It's been dead for a year now. 
Uh, Senate is exerting significant pressure on both the public printer and the administrative office of the courts. I believe they're about a month away from reviving the program and getting it back online. But it's still just a, a very first step. Um, Erica Wayne from Stanford Law Library prepared a petition. Over a thousand people signed it. And that petition went to the courts and the Congress. And it said uh, every document and pacer should be digitally signed. This is a no-brainer these days. And we want a copy of every PACER document for the Federal Depository Library Program. Um, I don't know if that petition is going to be granted, but there, there's significant pressure on the courts right now to do something, I think. You mentioned um, value-added services, and you know, I would assume that you know, West and Lexus with head notes and annotations and everything follows that. How far does that idea stretch in terms of taking, you know, like a Imagine it's just a printed statute, you know, might have an index or something. You put it into a database and add searching capability and cross-referencing capability without even adding any information to it. You've, in a sense, added value in terms of usability. Is that is there a threshold where you say, you know, this, this ought to be public domain, but at some point you've added enough value to it that you could exert some kind of copyright? I think if West puts it into a database as a private actor that they should be able to get copyright on their database. Um, that's a compilation that makes a lot of sense. On the other hand, if it's a state actor that did that index or that annotation, no. right? And that was our argument with the Oregon legislature. That it wasn't West that was doing the annotations. It was the lawyer for the legislature that was doing the annotation. And then a second issue is if, as acting as an agent of the state, West is the official reporter of some jurisdiction, and by adding value, they cordon off the public domain and make it impossible to get to that core in the center, then I think there's a public policy issue. And that's why we're pushing law.gov, because that way you've got a distributed, authenticated repository that West and Lexus and anybody else can download, add value, and it makes the line much clearer. Um, and right now we have this very weird situation in which you know, the, the law is public, but the page numbers in the official reports are not. And so how do you pull out the public part from the private part? Um, and that's the issue I have with the current system. I have no objection to West and Lexus making billions of dollars as long as competition is there. And to me, this is much a barriers to entry and innovation issue as it is anything else. Fair competition. More questions? I was wondering, do you know if anyone's ever tried applying uh, some of the, uh, like the open source software licensing to documents like this? Like, uh, I like thinking about how, you know, as a programmer, you can use this open source free stuff to make money, but if you do, you also must make it available for download the original port of the free part as well, this kind of thing? Well, that there, might be so there's two issues there. One is uh, commercial versus non-commercial. And I, I, the Oregon legislature uh, actually offered to do a non-commercial use only license as a negotiating position. We turned that down. Because you know what's the line between commercial and non-commercial? There's no restrictions. Um, so that's one issue. The other issue is could, instead of um, saying there's no copyright, could the attorney general simply license it under Creative Commons? You can do anything you want, attribution requested. You know, I'd be fine with that. I still don't think he's got a valid copyright. But uh, um, you know, this is a pragmatic thing. And as long as the material becomes available and there's progress and a recognition of the public's access, I could probably live with that. Um, but I still think, you know, certainly on statutes, uh, you know, you really, there, there is no license to grant because you don't own the property in the first place. And like I said, the attorney general opinions are right on the edge of that cloud. So if he were to say, well, you know, we're not going to waive copyright, but we will do creative commons and allow anybody to use it, I'd probably go look for another state. Great, thank you very much.